Again, welcome if you've just joined us. Uh, my name is Carol LaFluffy. I'm a board member of Preservation Mirage. We're waiting to get started here, just um, uh, opening up the waiting room and waiting for all of you to join us. I'll just mention that you should probably be seeing one window that has all the pictures of uh, like the Brady Bunch or whatever. And then you also should have a window open that has the Johnny Dawson slide, the first slide of the presentation. So you might want to just make sure that you can see both both windows of the people and the slides and make them however big or where, where you want them. Thanks, John. John's Thank our you. administrator and I want to acknowledge him for his help with setting up our last few Zoom sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, while we're waiting to get started here, there's a couple things. I'd love to just uh, go over some Zoom uh, 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 etiquette or Zoom <laughs> housekeeping. Um, as you come on, you're going to be muted and you will be muted during the presentation. Um, you are more than welcome to uh, put any questions that you might have in the chat box as we go along. But at the end, um, Stephen will stop his screen share once he finishes his presentation and uh, he would be happy to answer any questions. And if you decide that you do wanna ask a question directly, all you have to do is unmute yourself which you will see on the bottom left-hand side of the Zoom screen, there's a little microphone. And on that microphone, you'll just check it and push your, uh, you know, your cursor and then you will be unmuted. Um, I know that everybody's gonna have questions. So we'll just ask people to be politely <laughs> waiting to give their question. And um, we're looking forward to some great dialogue at the end. So please don't be shy and uh, get ready with some great questions. It's about 5.01 uh, right now. Um, so um, I am going to go over a couple of messages um, and things to tell you all, which is kind of exciting. Um, if you, and I'm going to show this at the end and mention it again, but if you live in Rancho Mirage, you will be receiving uh, shortly in the mail a copy of our new architecture map which we're very excited about. It's a printed piece. I'm gonna show it at the end. And also it will be available in a few days on our Preservation Mirage website as a PDF that you can download. Again, I'll show it at the end once we're finished. I wanted to uh, remind everybody at this point too that our next session is December the 7th with Courtney Newman. And uh, the invites are gonna be going out uh, for that one in the next couple of days. So please don't forget to RSVP and that one's gonna be a lot of fun. That's our last one for the year. Um, if you could also please uh, keep an eye on the website. Um, this session is going to be recorded. It is being recorded and will be up on the site as well as all of our other sessions for you to view if you missed any of them along the way. The other thing we'd love to point out on the website is our volunteer uh, tab. We are going to be running two tours in Modernism Week, uh, February 2022, and we are looking for volunteers and please feel free to add your name to that list on the website. And uh, also on there will be, uh, you know, just everything that we're up to and again, wanting to remind everybody that we are always looking for donations as um, we are not for profit. And also with the lack of um, in-person events, we have, uh, we've not been able to raise money in the normal ways that we do. So we appreciate all donations. So 
Um, I think we've got 35 people now uh, on and it's about 5.03. So I think that I'm going to start by introducing Stephen. We are very excited to have Stephen um, today presenting and um, I'm thrilled to have him in my living room. <laughs> I'm in my bedroom. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio. Stephen Price is an author speaker, historian, and a recognized authority on California's mid-century architecture. In history, form, and its preservation, he's been making frequent appearances in print, online, radio, and video documentaries on Los Angeles and Palm Springs architecture and urbanism for many years. His landmark book, Truesdale Estates, Mid-Century to Modern in Beverly Hills, was published in 2017 by Regan Arts. And if you don't have it, can you all see it there? Mm -hmm. There's the book. I happened to see it at Just Fabulous the other day, and it is really? available. Support your local bookstores if you can. Um, and um, he is also the author of another wonderful book, which is on the Marrakesh Country Club, this book is currently available at the club in the pro shop. And um, Stephen serves on the board of directors of the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation and has served as a consultant to the city of Beverly Hills for its Cultural Heritage Commission. He is also the co-director of the Harold W. Levitt Professional Archive, curating and maintaining the scholarly legacy of the modernist Los Angeles architect. Since 2015, Stephen has made his home in Palm Desert, where he views life from alongside the eighth tree tea box at the Marrakesh Country Club, although I think he's recently relocated to mm. another fabulous location in Palm <laughs> Desert. And um, we are just thrilled to have him today. We are also thrilled to say that this presentation on Johnny Dawson, um, we are, we're, it's the world premiere. So we're very excited. And Stephen, uh, whenever you're ready, we'd love to get going. Thank you, Carol. Um, I do want to make a slight uh, correction to the uh, intro in that I'm no longer serving on the board of the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. I am serving now on the architecture and design committee for the Palm Desert Historical Society. And I'm very proud to do that. It's a new group, and we're going to be doing a lot of wonderful, fun stuff, um, getting the word out about the great architecture of Palm Desert and Down Valley. So I want to start by thanking uh, Melissa, Carol, John, and, and everybody at Preservation Mirage for arranging this with me. Um, and then we're going to jump right in. OK. So why are we here? Um, I'm actually the the top of the of the uh, presentation is hidden by a where it's like um, it's, it's blocked by um, this bar here. All right, and well, so why are we here? We often hear that someone is the father of this or the mother of that, and in many cases, that's an overstatement or at least a convenient bundling of facts and omissions. But in this case, I can say without fear of contradiction or exception that John W. Dawson really and truly is the originator of the life on a golf course lifestyle as we know it today here in the Coachella Valley, which following his pioneering examples has flourished from Palm Springs to La Quinta and beyond, uh, making scenes like the one in this image commonplace where once there was only sands and brush. A bit of background on Dawson, uh, he was born in 1902 in Illinois, he became a crack golfer at a young age, competing in amateur tournaments as early as 16 years old, and was widely acknowledged as a true prodigy of the game uh, in his time. In 1920, he landed a job with A.G. Spalding Sporting Goods. But in 1929, the PGA ruled that, a, that such involvement violated his amateur status. So he was banned from playing in PGA tournaments until 1947, when he finally left Spalding. It was widely regarded uh, as a real loss to the game of golf uh, that these years of playing were lost to him. Um, as a matter of fact, in 1929, he offered to resign from Spalding and they, they wouldn't let him out of his contract. So that's why there was that long uh, 
long time in the wilderness for him. Now, uh, she's not shown here yet. We'll see her later. But um, John Dawson met Velma Pascoe in 1931. She had been a dancer and actress, bit parts in Paramount films, but had also done the vaudeville circuit alongside Edgar Bergen. It was there that she learned she had a talent for puppetry, leading her to actually fabricating the puppet known to the world as Howdy Doody, not creating the character, but, but fabricating the puppet. This gave her some entree into the world of Hollywood, which cachet she would bring with her to her future husband's later ventures. They married in 1937. But back to golf, because um, that's what really he was all about in every way. Dawson's first golf business venture was the Mission Valley Golf Club outside San Diego in 1949. It is now called the Riverwalk Club. Uh, courses and clubs at that time commonly, and in some cases even still, are entirely separated from the outside world by tall fences or hedges or streets or all of it from the any neighboring structures most of the time. But Dawson loved and lived the idea of life on the link so much. He envisioned setting homes right at the edge of the fairway greens, creating vistas that looked like a private park was sprawling from one's own back window or back patio. He almost immediately began looking for locations to make this vision a reality while he was at Mission, uh, Mission Valley, focusing his search for whatever reason on the Coachella Valley. Not the first place you would think to uh, look for a place to lay vast lawns in the late 1940s. But after surveying various parts of the valley by air, he found a site for sale that possessed, possessed six qualities he felt would make a successful location for the topography of the game, uh, drainage, water availability, manageable wind, and a supposed extra hour of sunshine among them, the Thunderbird Ranch outside Palm Springs. Now the ranch owned by Barney Hinkle and the colorful former mayor of Palm Springs, Frank Bogert, wasn't succeeding as a tourism venture. So Dawson, along with a few investor pals, came to an agreement to buy the property. Work began on its development, and in 1951, we were introduced to Thunderbird Country Club, boasting the only 18-hole golf course in the area. At this time in history, in the, in the early 50s, the only golf courses in Palm Springs were the private O'Donnell Club, which was nine holes, and there was the Cochrane Ranch to the Northeast, which was also nine holes, but that was not a venture that was designed to last or destined to last. Here we see work beginning on the course designed by Lawrence Hughes. The remaining ranch structures would either be incorporated into the clubhouse and facilities or make way for large lots for custom homes. The decision to bring in architect William Cody to adapt the original ranch house into a lavish and suitable country clubhouse was an inspired marriage of style and vision. The floor plan of the building reflects and expands the relaxed geometry of the structure um, and the original lines, but generates the dramatic geometry for which Cody became famous. And in this, in this iteration, he also would install things like a sunken bar, where the bar was set two steps down below the seating area with a window behind it that would look out onto the first tee, um, at, which was a show in, in and of itself. Now, remember, in the early 1950s, the Western motif was the major one around here, uh, called Palm Springs back then. I mean, all the way out to Indian Wells. And uh, Rancho Mirage, Indian Wells, and Palm Desert would eventually incorporate as municipalities and grow their own identities. Adjacent to the clubhouse area was a grouping of 14 cottages for rental by the members. And I think these were only available on short-term bases um, and to, again, to club members only. Many of you know these cottages because of the recent battle to save them, the Cody design structures from being raised and preservation advocate that I can be, I've been studying the preservation versus progress dynamic at all the properties we're seeing today, which I'll circle back to at the end. 
Since we're focusing really on the lifestyle that Dawson developed, I'm going to present a couple of examples that uh, of Greens Front Living that I think really show the appeal. They were radical in their day, and even now, uh, many were created and maintained at a level that still approaches the realm of fantasy. The house that Paul Revere Williams designed for Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz is one of them. And I'm sure Desi picked up enough uh, from life at Thunderbird that before he launched his own venture with the Indian Wells Country Club. And there's even where there's even a residential area up in the foothills east of the golf course, not on the golf course, but uh, it's an area with streets named, wait for it, Desi Drive and Lou Circle. So that's Eddie Sasala, by the way, who, who is said to have invented the electric golf cart with Desi in the bottom right. Now next door is one of the most iconic examples of this lifestyle that we're talking about. Again, by William Cody. Now I warn you, this talk might appear to be the Bill Cody show as much as it's the Johnny Dawson show, but their work is inextricably linked. This is one of the best examples of another phenomenon. While the fronts of the houses to the street, even inside the club gates, are often uh, quite closed and protective, we can see here how the backs are wide open uh, to the vistas of greens, mountains, and sky. I mean, what appears to be white under the eaves on, in the center of the photo is actually uh, draperies closed to the sun. Um, this also meant that the home's interiors visible to passing golfers set off a new kind of interior design competition because people wanted the, the interiors to be seen, that were seen to be as impressive as, uh, as could be. Another example is the famed fire, Leonard Firestone estate by William Pereira. This was a little later in the 70s, um, right next to the Gerald and Betty Ford house. They're on Sand Dune Road behind a private gate that was put up when the Fords moved there. Um, and, but you can see, this is a continuation of the, of the golf course greens right up to the, uh, up to the property line. And, and by the way, it's got a better view of, of the golf course than the Ford house. Now, John Dawson himself commissioned a William Cody home. Uh, I'm including member Barney Hinkle's residence uh, by Cody also, which is on the other side of the Ball Arnaz residence from the Jorgensen Mavis to once again show the unbroken boundary between public and private spaces. Again, that's, uh, this, is, this is really a landmark kind of, of development of, of innovation um, to have that kind of breezy access. Speaking of innovations, um, one of the game-changing innovations was the advent of the electric golf cart. And as uh, legend has it, it was developed primarily uh, at, and introduced into wide use at uh, Thunderbird Country Club. And you can see the first parade of the golf carts there um, on the bottom left. Um, I had to stop myself from, from putting in the picture of Bob Hope's golf cart, which had his face, made, a likeness of his, of his image uh, on it because I bet, you know, we're trying to be serious here. Now, one of the great chestnuts in the lore of Thunderbird is it inspiring the name of the famous car. Now, with most legends like this, there's only a kernel of truth and a lot of conjecture. But in this case, it's actually true. Ernest Beach was chairman of the Ford Motor Company in the early 1950s and confided to Johnny one day that his marketing department was having a devil of a time coming up with a name for the new sport coupe. Well, guess what Johnny suggested? Um, there's two prototypes up at top, and I thought those would be interesting to see because uh, what was eventually did come out of the assembly line is uh, the uh, is is what you see below. It, and here he and uh, Johnny and Velma are in front of the model they received from Ford. It was the very first one to roll off the assembly line in 1954. It was available to the public in 1955. Now, it's probably just a coincidence, but certainly didn't hurt the image of the club that President Eisenhower started a trend of presidents either visiting, playing, or residing at the club. The seven who have done so are pictured here. And this, together with the original stardust provided by Bob Hope, or Bing Crosby, Clark Gable, Randolph Scott, Bill Harris, Alice Faye, Lucy and Desi, and Hoagie Carmichael, got the place off to a rocketing start in terms of prestige and desirability. 
Now, Johnny Dawson once made the evocative analogy of development being like a hog in a barrel of apples. You've always got your eye on the next one. And the next one was El Dorado Country Club in Indian Wells, which was further east than Rancho Mirage from, from Palm Springs. This club built on former date groves and citrus orchards was to be even more lavish than Thunderbird as everything in it was built new and to the highest standards. Now I show you these oft shared black and white photos by Julia Shulman. Oh, sorry, that's the next slide. The famous North facade of the clubhouse by William Cody a patrician elegant pavilion that embodies what we mean when we call a building iconic. And there's Johnny and, and Bill Cody checking out the plans. Uh, here we go. I show these oft shared black and white photos by Julia Schulman as a reminder of the club as built. And the front is originally designed by William Cody. We will get to the current state of this structure at the end of the presentation. Uh, but one of the most fun things to me about being a kind of architectural archaeologist is discovering things we don't often see or cannot, connecting uh, the dots that were not apparent over time because the Cody design was not the first choice for El Dorado. In 1950s, He said that while he did not originate it, uh, the Hollywood and Hollywood Regency comes from the uh, uh, set designers and art directors of films who had these exaggerated effects of classical architecture in their films, uh, flattened or broadened. And that's really what he pulled from is the suggestion of, of classical elements. But he had become its most prolific visionary. So he didn't originate it, but he really took it and ran with it. Now the clubhouse design, as with many of Wolf's non-residential buildings, was a rather straightforward modernist assemblage with very few exterior flourishes and certainly no mansard roof. All right, now I want you to take a look at these renderings and section and keep them in mind because we're going to summon that recollection later. Now, here are some decorative details, including the madly Rococo pierced ceramic or plaster uh, modular screen dividing the entry foyer from the proposed main dining room. And who could resist being carried away by those Soigne model figures? I just love those. Wolf used those a lot. But alas, the scheme was not meant to be. A year into the design work, some of the club movers and shakers united behind co-developer Russell Wade and egged on by, I am pretty sure, industrialist Robert McCulloch, to replace Wolf with their guy, Bill Cody. And so Dawson was made to take Wolf off the project. And that had to be a personal setback for Dawson as well as for the architect. Now that said, what Cody did was bring fruition to arguably the finest and longest lasting assemblage of club buildings, cottages, such as in this rendering, which is on the west side of the clubhouse, uh, there was another set on the east side where President Eisenhower lived while his house by Wilton Beckett was being built on the 11th fairway. And here's the El Dorado Cottages East in recent years. Well, uh, on the bottom right is in recent years. The classical Julius Shulman photos are from the uh, 1961. Um, as you can see, I hope, the architecture has held up surprisingly well. And unlike any, uh, another club in the Valley who has been the venue for a loud and long preservation debate on its collection of Cody cottages, no call has been heard to dismantle or replace these. Now, many of the private homes in this enclave remain today some 70 years later as a pinnacle of cachet and exclusivity. Where we are fortunate is when an architect of Cody's stature warranted documentation in the top press of the day. So we have these hugely influential and evocative photos by Julius of uh, Cody's famed Chanel House, clearly demonstrating that unbroken wonderland of lawn melting into golf greens. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very it's one of the great tragedies of preservation in uh, in this valley that this house was uh, altered significantly to the point of it not being 
existing is recognizable. This happens sometimes through throughout here. Now that we see some of the same vibe of the of the property, the pet, pool patio going onto the grass in this trio of photos uh, documenting a visit by President Kennedy to his predecessor in 1962. Now country clubs are being the private places they are. More modern day photo documentation can be hard to come by. So I'm sharing these photos I snapped while visiting a house coincidentally again by William Cody, just west of the clubhouse because I couldn't help myself. Now, normally when I go on a tour of houses, I do not snap pictures, but this one took my breath away so much. Um, I, I whipped out my cell phone. That's why there are such terrible pictures, but I was just in thrall. Now, a friend of mine who happens, a gallerist friend of mine, just happens to have a rendering of the house in his showroom, but he didn't know what, what it was. So I was glad to be able to connect those dots, as I said before, I love stuff like that. Oh, and by the way, I mean, one of the most arresting things about this house is it's mosaic tiled pool. Uh, normally, you wouldn't think that yellow, brown, and red are colors that you'd want to see in a pool water, but the, this is original from, this, from the time it was built in the 70s, the early 70s, and it is a fabulous assemblage. So this concludes our visit to El Dorado. Uh, and the next time we see Ike, He's at Johnny Dawson's next venture, Seven Lakes Country Club in Palm Springs proper. And the reason I have this up is because this is where he hit the only home run of his golf career in 1968. A happy moment. Uh, planning for Seven Lakes was begun in 1961. It opened in 1964 and construction was completed in all phases by 1967. The rendering here shows mo mostly the clubhouse, which, um, it's just a beautifully rendered uh, view of what what people could expect when when it was realized. Um, it's a much smaller, low low key, smaller clubhouse, but it ri with rich with rifts on the El Dorado portico. Now, by the way, you'll notice that the club um, dining room is elevated above uh, a, a level below. And this was also true at uh, El Dorado. There was a tunnel that went under the main clubhouse. Apparently Johnny Dawson hated seeing golf carts go by as he was dining. I don't know why, but he didn't want to see them. So they are now, they're subterranean here at uh, El Dorado and at Marrakesh, which we'll see shortly. The course compared to other Dawson developments is relatively level not as contoured as others that came before or after. And that may be because this was the first time he introduced um, housing as part of the package. And these were not custom built homes. They were provided by, they were built and offered by the developer. But the, uh, the linear nature of the, of the golf course may have been in balance to the long low lines of the architecture of the attached homes lining the fairways. Here we see how the landscape hugging villas were marketed in 1964. I wish these were in color, Must, might have been really wild. Uh, their architecture by Richard Harrison, who with Donald Wexler was one of Palm Springs most important design partnerships in mid-century modern architecture, clearly owes a debt of gratitude this, to the Sandpiper condo clusters of Palm Desert by uh, William Kreisel with their similar linear qualities and cast concrete block walls at lower right. But the Harrison uh, units were larger from the beginning. Some of the uh, sand uh, sandpiper units are quite small, but these were large and luxurious from the very beginning. Now to see how well this design direction is held up, these modern day images show the protective fronts sheltering completely open back patios. And there's also usually a, uh, a big uh, enclosed patio behind those walls. Uh, again, with the division between the lawn covered common area indistinguishable from the golf greens, both close and distant. Now at the far west edge of the Seven Lakes acreage, there are groupings of single story condominium units on two floors. I'm pointing these up because the same scheme was proposed later at another Dawson development, but never realized. 
Uh, they're quite luxurious, these units, and I've heard of various reasons this type of development might have been included in the offering, whether it was as an alternative to being right on the greens as the golf course didn't extend all the way to the west, or economy of density from the developer standpoint. But perhaps the best explanation I uh, have heard offered is that the west end of the development stands in proximity to a very busy stretch of Highway 111 and the double height bulk of the buildings possibly serving as sound barriers of sorts. Okay, Marrakesh Country Club, um, the pink jewel of the desert. So finally, 10 years later, John Dawson is able to convince uh, John Wolfe to design a project for him. Uh, it's uh, on 155 acres in Palm Desert, South Palm Desert, um, on the Haystack Ranch, which he leases from uh, not the Indians, but a swimmer designer, uh, Elizabeth Stewart of Cole of California. And he lets Wolf just have the run of everything. He says, you can, you can design everything, uh, the houses, the clubhouse, the, the all the buildings, the pool pavilions, they started with this conical roofed entry kiosk, which is like the most whimsical thing in the world. I, I remember when I first saw this complex in, nine, in 2009, I was driving down the street uh, from up at the Reserve Country Club and I looked to my left and said, what the heck is that? I went home and looked it up and found it was Marrakesh Country Club designed by John Wolfe, which I had never heard before. And I've been studying Wolfe pretty much all my life and had even visited the archives um, from the Truesdale book. But um, this was a revelation. Everything is pink. This is the rendering that Wolfe used to sell Dawson's vision back to him. Uh, it's very romantic. It's very different for the desert. Uh, getting John Wolfe to do this project was a huge feather in Dawson's cap because he was at the very tip top of, of let's say, Beverly Hills um, status at the time. So having him come out to the desert uh, was a big deal to begin with. It was, so I want you to take notice of the, the club building at the top because the shape of it was curved around the, uh, around the front courtyard with the fountain, with the water channel down, kind of bowed at the back. So this was the original design for the clubhouse by John Wolfe. And you can see it in better close up here. These were the renderings uh, of it. And you can see in the back, there were like the, the gazebos at each side on the golf front, the hill going down from the dining room. But this was not to be. Wolf was able to manage designing the, as I said, the club, the, uh, the guard kiosk, the administration building, all the houses, the pool pavilions. But he was just beginning to be affected by Parkinson's disease. And this is uh, 19... 69, the first families moved in. So in 1970, he was still working on the drawings for the clubhouse and it wasn't going anywhere. Whether it was the distance between Los Angeles and, and here, I don't know. I think they were very frustrated with each other. Uh, Johnny Dawson had a big, big social schedule lined up to announce the, uh, to, uh, to open the club and inaugurate the club and get things going. A lot of publicity, a lot of events, so he had to eventually take the commission away from, from Wolf for the clubhouse. He, and by the way, so this is, uh, I wanted you to remember, this was the, the proposed clubhouse at El Dorado. So you can see that Wolf had imported some of the ideas pretty much directly over to Marrakesh to finally fulfill his vision. The clubhouse as built was, was built by Richard Harrison, who had been uh, with Don Wexler. They had split up in uh, 1962, I believe. Um, and Rick had uh, done work on Johnny Dawson's house in Thunderbird, remodeling it for him, uh, and then had done the condos at Seven Lakes. So 
when Johnny needed somebody to come in and fix, uh, finish this building, um, this is who he turned to. Now, what, what Harrison did was basically square off the uh, Wolf program. And it's a very nice patrician building. Uh, it's, it's been expanded in recent years. It's undergoing a renovation now. Uh, and we'll see what that looks like when it uh, premieres next year, hopefully. If not, in two, if not it'll, we'll see it in 2023. But so before all the drama, this was Marrakesh. The, the top left is, is the Haystack Ranch beneath, named for Haystack Mountain, which I didn't realize until like living there for three years. Um, this is looking actually east towards um, Mount Eisenhower there at, um, on, on the top left. The groundbreaking there, I don't know what that water channel was. I know that there was, it was kind of a little bit of a floodplain um, at one point uh, until the development of this, of this uh, community. Uh, now there's a bunch of, of culverts that divert the water. Although at one point, Early on in in, re, in the building of the residences, the, the um, rain did flood on the golf course, and we we had pictures of washing machines floating down the golf course. Um, so there's John, and um, I'm not sure who the two other people are, uh, overlooking the model of of Marrakesh, and here at the right bottom you can see the 26 foot elevated. Plinth, the, the mound upon which the clubhouse rests, uh, which was, you know, a really dramatic thing to do. And from here, you can see all over the valley. It's a dramatic space, a beautiful view, and it's one of the most pleasant places I know. Here we see um, the development probably about up to 19... Seven sections have been built. The first seven sections of houses have been built. The clubhouse is there at the bottom center. Um, the area between the golf course, which is the first part laid, and the houses on a grid in, back towards the mountains, that was the last uh, seven sections of, of Marrakesh to be developed. And things were not financially easy all the time. So it was, it was thought that maybe what they would do is put the same kind of two-story buildings, uh, Seven Lakes, here in the back. Uh, I don't know exactly how heated that discussion was, but it was determined not to do that. It really truly would have altered uh, the landscape in a big way. So uh, Marrakesh has remained a, a, a community of, of single family homes. Well, they're attached, there's, there's two houses uh, sharing a wall, and yeah, most of them. So this is fun. This is the decor that, that we that they used to sell Marrakesh and, and furnished models. It's very wild. It's not like I, I look at staging of today and it's so tame and so bland and so white and so beige. And but they, you know, back in 1970, it was wild. And I love this. Here's another one. Um, I mean, I could just move into this right, right as it was. And these have never been seen before. Well, not since the 1970s. So I'm glad to show them to you. Uh, I mentioned the pool pavilions. I mean, this is the kind of presentation that Wolf was famous for. And this is what, I mean, made Dawson bringing him to the desert unique. There's nothing like this in, in the Palm Springs area. I mean, I thought when I first saw it, oh, okay, there's gotta be a bunch of places like this. You know, because I did know that Hollywood Regency was a very popular style in the 60s and 70s. But I was surprised to find there was actually very little built. It's come to be reintroduced the Hollywood Regency style mainly, and this has been since the 2000s, mainly as housewares. So this is the only built architectural expression of the style that's really excellent, uh, you know, apart from some, some track housing, which uses it as a kind of facade device. Um, and again, um, well, here, let me go on to this one. This shows the indoor outdoor lifestyle, again, that uh, Johnny Dawson was, was a champion pioneer of. The pool houses are now fenced around them, uh, of course, for safety. It's too bad. I think um, 
and this is a personal family photo from the mid 70s of, of a family just hanging out by the pool on one of the one of the islands surrounding uh, on one of the lower streets so casual so californian so easy so breezy um look, by the way uh wolf even designed the standing light fixtures or the street lights at marrakesh and uh, they are still there now, as I said, the, the pool pavilions have been fenced in uh, for safety reasons, for, uh, you know, permanent reasons. I mean, sorry, uh, regulation reasons. But this is the, uh, again, there's a green sward uh, off to the right here. This was my pool, um, my first pool. I've had two houses at Marrakesh. And as you can see, um, it, it, a lot of the houses didn't front the golf course. They would front green swards or islands like this or, or the pool pavilion. So there was a variety of, of, of views, but it's all pink. It's a custom color. It's repainted every eight, uh, eight years. The houses themselves, here's a, a, you know, one of the two of the plans, they all have front courtyards for private socializing. Um, these are, you know, with walls to the street, uh, they you know, they serve as entry. They really serve as entry halls to the houses. Some have actually put pools in their courtyards. Um, I had one in my last house, which was lovely. Um, but because the backs were so open, there was no other place to socialize without this. And these are the views from from the houses. I mean, this the top one is is the view from my house, uh, my first house there, and it was magical i used to say it was like living in a dr seuss book i mean the pom-pom uh trees the olive trees that are cut just so whimsically the, the fountain the mountains it was just the view changed all day long and it was wonderful and the two below are just um you know other houses of friends of ours this shows the basic basic feeling of of the residential parts of the of the community they're loose they're all the houses are very well placed so they're not in a line they're all very very uh staggered and different and never looks the same here's i think the perfect picture uh this is taken from above the clubhouse and it just shows you can see how some people have hedged in their um their back patios from passers-by on the golf course. And um, I found after, after living there for a, a brief period of time that I didn't want to close myself off from the people in my club. Uh, I you know, didn't need a, to be, have my own pool, although one came with the house, but um, it's, it was the essence of a community that was just so open. You wanted to be part of it all the time. Now, this, this view, uh, I think we did put this in the in the Marrakesh book, but um, I used to walk down past this this fairway on hot days, and the mountainsides, that's Mount Eisenhower there, were so barren, I thought, gosh, we look like we are in a Garden of Eden under a glass dome, and right outside that glass dome are these mountains, like we were on Mars or something. So one day I made this picture to make the you know, just have it expressed. I mentioned the, the um, Marrakesh book and Carol mentioned it also. It is available as, um, as she said, in the pro shop at Marrakesh Country Club. If you know somebody there, it's the only way to get it. Um, and I'm very proud of it. By 2018 for Modernism Week, and gave out copies and i uh, read it again last night and i'm still proud of it so i want to thank you for your attention i want to thank you for your time and um we are going to i hope i haven't left you with more questions and answers but i'll be glad to answer any oh oh so sorry sorry i'm getting ahead of myself getting ahead of myself so this is um I said that we, we would we would um, come back to the current look of El Dorado, which is the, the pictures on the right of the screen. And actually, I thought that I 
because then versus the urge to update, create, imprint, whatever. But that's a long debate, probably better for another time. And actually in my life, it pretty much happens every day, but it gives me an excuse to show you the vaunted Clubhouse of El Dorado, how it looks today. After a modeling in, I think 2006 by architect Frank Yerudia, who was in fact at one time an associate of the Cody office and is considered by some as his natural successor. So if you were going to update a club that was at that point 60 years old, who else would you call? But this was the result. And so I am always wondering about why, you know, I feel that it's too bad that we lose things. Um, you know, so that, again, that's that's another that's another conversation for another time. So again, I want to thank you and I'll take questions now. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, here we should have everybody showing up on the screen. And that was fabulous. Um, we don't have any questions yet. We have lots of great comments on the chat. But if anybody would like to unmute and ask Stephen a question, he's, he's here. Thanks Hi. again to everybody for coming. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for the presentation. It was nice. Uh, a lot of the renderings were beautiful. Uh, where was your source for those? Where did you find the renderings for the different uh, country clubs? Um, uh, which ones? The the John Wolf renderings? Um, yes, and, uh, just in general. You know, what was your source for getting those? Uh, I've been researching renderings? for. Well, I mean, I've been researching what I'd like to say. You know, thirty years in a lot of this stuff. Um, so I've, I've been to the archives of several architects at the U University of California, Santa Barbara in their special collections. Um, sometimes we had them, the Marrakesh ones, we had some of them on, on site or people share them with me. It's, it's just a, you know, a wonderful community of people who once they find out you're interested in something. Great, thank you. Steven. Steven? I think we might have lost Steven, possibly. Um, Carol, do you want to have yeah. him come into your computer, maybe? Sure. Something? Yeah, definitely. There he is. Steven, can you hear me? I hear somebody. <laughs> I just wanted to make a small correction. That photograph of Johnny Dawson with Eddie Susella, that's not Eddie Susella. I knew Eddie very well. There's somebody else. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, that was cutting out and I'm sorry I didn't hear what you said. The photograph of Johnny Dawson in a golf cart with Eddie Susella, that's not Eddie Susella. It's somebody else, obviously, but not Eddie. I knew Eddie, I played golf with him. Um, it's not Eddie. Small. Can we hear on yours? Yeah. I love your presentation. We're gonna we're gonna switch over to another computer in just a second. Hang on, just a second. Should I mute this one? Okay. Recording in progress. Uh, Stephen or Carol, I think you're muted. So maybe oh. you work. Okay, there we go. I think there Carol's go. one is. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Stephen. Did you, did you hear what Hoagie said? I didn't hear what Mr. Carmichael said. So I'm I'm going to ask him to do it one more time. I apologize. The photograph of Eddie, I mean of Johnny Dawson, sitting in the Thunderbird golf cart with Eddie Susella. That's ah. not Eddie. Oh, somebody else. 
just a small correction for history. I don't know who that other person is. I knew Eddie very well. Mm -hmm. Not Eddie. See, that was the caption that I that I saw uh, where I got the photograph. Yeah, I um, he was the. I understand that he was the golf pro, and he went with um, Mr. Dawson to El Dorado, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for I, the correction. I played El Dorado on the first day it opened. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And Indian Wells, actually, the first day it opened. Wow. Now, my understanding is that the course as we see it at El Dorado today is not as it was designed. It was redesigned by, I think, Vic Fazio in 2003. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. So it's not only buildings that get redesigned, it's also the golf courses. It happens all the time. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Don't be afraid. Hi, this is Sue Todd Yates from Thunderbird. Hi. Hi, and I loved your early tribute to Velma, but I just wanted to continue that little strand because she was his muse for many of the other courses that he did, including Marrakesh. That was her dream to have a Moroccan themed course down here in the valley. And she did the interior design work for most of the courses. Right. Starting right. with Thunderbird. She's right. enormous. She was way more than Howdy Doody's mother. She was an enorm enormously talented woman. So, and um, I take credit for inviting Mr. Carmichael to join us. He's been reconnecting with Thunderbird and helping us with some historical memories there. So, he was a very well uh, cognizant young teenager when the club opened in 1951. Wow. And now he's great. become a very good friend to some of us. So uh -huh. anyway. Well, thank you for that. I want to also say that, you know, uh, clearly uh, Velma Dawson was a, a force to be uh, reckoned with. Um, the other thing is that they divorced she and Johnny in 1970 as Marrakesh was opening up, but they still remained in residence. And they, um, until he died in 1986, she died in 2008, and they both had uh, their own houses there. And uh, so clearly they loved the place very much. Uh, hey, Steve, this has been great. Um, I have a question about the clubhouse at at Seven Lakes, you have a lot of history as to why Rick Harrison got to do the Marrakesh um, clubhouse. Do you have any idea why he didn't get to do Seven Lakes? Yeah. I don't really have uh, anything but a supposition. And I think the supposition is that Cody is like number one. He is, uh, if you can get him, you can get him. Um, but uh, again, we have to look at the period of time that it was being built. One might have been busy. He might have been trying to give uh, Harrison, you know, who was establishing his own practice at that time, uh, some of the work. And it may have been, it had been that uh, the Cody office was too busy to handle it. So I don't actually have a, a, a real answer. I have only my suppositions. Okay. Am I... Am I, am I, did I escape? Am I, am... <laughs> Don't be shy, ask questions. Oops. Or, or make corrections. I mean, I really, I, I'm happy when somebody has some information that I didn't know. And uh, I am certainly uh, always glad to find out the truth. All right. See anybody there you know you want oh, to. I see a lot of people. Yeah, I see. I see. I, I mean, I see Gary. I see. I see Russell. I, I saw. I mean, uh, uh, now there's two screens here. Alan Hess has joined us, and it's, it's an honor. And Adele Sigelman. Hi, everybody. Well, if, if anybody doesn't have any other questions, Tracy Conrad. 
Oh, we are, um, we can definitely wrap it up, but I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, anybody else? Final questions? Final jeopardy. <laughs> um, I'd like to also just remind you about our architecture map, um, which you will be receiving if you live in the Rancho Mirage uh, zip code in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're very proud of this. It's a printed map that will also be available Look soon on our website and you will be able to download it. Um, we would also like you to remind everyone to uh, mark your calendars for December 7th, our final session of the year with Courtney Newman, which will be fun. Um, and also, again, the website has all the recordings of our sessions, as well as um, a new uh, tab for volunteers, which we really would uh, like people to consider doing for modernism in February of 2022. We have a couple of great tours. Um, I want to thank Stephen Price <laughs> uh, for his wonderful presentation, and thank you all for coming tonight. And um, we hope to see you on December 7th with uh, Courtney. And thanks again, Carol, to John, for administrating our Zoom tonight. Carol, is, is there any way someone could see this presentation on yes, YouTube? Yes, it will be show, it will be available on our website in probably about three or four days under mm -hmm. preservation sessions. There's a pull-down mm -hmm. tab on our website. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Good night.